Praise the Lord. Before I hear the preach of God's word today, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we give thanks unto thee, for thou art good, for thy mercy endureth forever. Thou which pitieth them that fear thee, as a father pitieth his child. And we thank thee, Lord, that is of thy mercy, they are not consumed, for thy compassions filleth not, for they are new every morning. And as this is the day which thou hast made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it, we thank thee, Lord, for giving us this day our daily bread. As man shall not live by bread alone, but every word which proceedeth out of thy mouth. As newborn babes we desire the sincere milk of thy word, whereby we may grow thereby. Sanctify us with thy truth, for thy word is truth. Pray, O Lord, that you have been sanctified and cleansed unto the washing of the water of thy word. They may present unto thee, O Lord, a glorious church, not having spot the wrinkle of any such thing, to be holy without blemish, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us return once again to the book of Mark, chapter 5, continuing for a left off yesterday evening. In the Gospel of Mark, Chapter 5. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, it is written in verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the gatherings. And once again we saw how the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles to come over to the other side of the sea, which was the command of the Lord. He commanded them in Mark chapter 4, verse 35, let us pass over to the side, they had to go through a storm. Almost lost their lives. The ship was filled with water, as waves beat into the ship, and it was full of water. The apostles of Christ, which were, most of them were fishermen, especially James and John, whose earthly father was a fisherman, Zebedee, Therefore, they grew up on the sea. They grew up fishing. Therefore, when they said that they thought they were going to perish, it was a very bad storm. But the Lord showed forth an example unto us. He never leads us around the hard times. He never gives us shortcuts. We're to face the storms. We're to go through the storms. We're to face our mountains. And we have a mountain in front of us. Christ showed us his example of having faith in God. Mark chapter 11, verse 22, Christ says, have faith in God. Mark eleven twenty three. 23, therefore I say to you, whoever shall save this mountain, be thou or maybe thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt that his heart, but shall believe whatsoever they saith, shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Verse 24, therefore I say to you what things you desire. When ye pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. And there in the midst of an impossible situation, in the midst of a storm, Christ spoke the word, and the sea became calm. And Christ says in John chapter 14, verse 12, Verily I say unto you, He that believeth in me, the works that he shall we also do, and greater works that he shall we do, because I go and chew my Father. And Christ goes on the same verse 13, that whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I also do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 14, verse 14, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Christ showed forth an example of speaking to the storm and calming the storm. And if there's ever a time that we Christians need to have this kind of faith, faith in God, that our prayers will be answered, it is now. How many professing Christians today are full of the cares of this world? And what is the problem of a Christian being full of the cares of this world? Mark chapter 4, Christ says, verse 18, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of our things entry and choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. 
how many professing Christians, though they may have the word of God. Not a corruption. We're speaking of the authorized version of the Holy Bible. The preserved words of the Lord, which is preserved for us as pure words, which is preserved for us, but it's still unfruitful in the lives of professing Christians because the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things enter and choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. And today, there are so many professing Christians that are filled with the cares of this world, especially in this day we're living now in the year 2020. Today, there's so many professing Christians that are so full of the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things, and it chokes the word that it becometh unfruitful. If there's ever a time that Christians need to have faith in God, mountain-moving faith, the faith that speaks to storms and calms the storms, now is the time or to go through trials and tribulations. John chapter 16, verse 33, the Lord Jesus Christ says, and John chapter 16, verse 33, these things I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace in the world, ye shall, not might, not maybe, ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In this world, we shall have tribulation. And in this day we're living in these last days, we're going to have trials and tribulations. They're going to be increased as we read here in the word of God. Therefore, we must have faith in God. And why is it the Lord sends us forth into the storms? Why is it we must face our mountains? Why is it we are still in this world in which we shall have tribulation? Mark chapter 5, verse 2. And when he, the Lord Jesus Christ, has come out of the ship, immediately there met him a man out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Why did Christ take his apostles to the midst of the storm and the sea to cross through this side? Why did Christ command his apostles, let us go over to this side and go through the midst of a storm and use faith in God to calm the storm to get here to the side? Because immediately, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could he man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. There was this lunatic, naked, bleeding, unkept, with an unclean spirit filled with devils. As we found out later, he had a legion of devils in him, a complete lunatic who had his dwelling in the tombs. No man could bind him. He had supernatural strength of a chains on him. He would break them asunder. They could not bind him. Had his dwelling in the tombs and cried out night and day, cutting himself with stones. Christ crossed over that sea in the midst of the storm, take his apostles with him as well. For that man, for that soul. Why are we here in this world which we shall tribulation? For soul's sake. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some may count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why has not the Lord taken his church out of this world yet? Because the Lord is willing for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now is the time for souls to be saved. In the church of Jesus Christ, 
His saints are still in this world today, though it may be few and far between, as witnesses unto Christ for souls' sakes. Souls are more important than your comfort. Therefore, Christ took his apostles in a ship to cross the sea in the midst of a storm, danger, endangering his apostles' lives, endanger the ship for that one precious soul, that lunatic who abode there in the tombs, cutting himself, crying out night and day. He would endanger his apostles' lives and even the ship and even his own life just to get to that soul. Once again, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Christ says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and it shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. And once again, that word witness in the Greek tongue means martyrs. And why did the apostles of Christ, excluding Judas is scared to betray Christ, and the apostle John, though they tried to martyr him, they could not do so. But why did the apostles of Christ suffer martyrdom for? For soul's sake, as a witness unto Christ. And as they died, they died triumphantly, filled, filled with the Holy Ghost, as witnesses unto Christ. Even the apostle Peter, history tells us, was crucified upside down. Why was that so? History tells us because he wanted to give his last sermon from the cross. And he asked to be crucified upside down. And history tells us the early church writes about his martyrdom that he did so as he preached a sermon. That's how he was first born into the world upside down. And then he preached about the second birth, the new birth, how you must be born again. That's what the Apostle Peter preached from the cross, crucified upside down. He preached about the new birth until he died. Or how about the Apostle Andrew? They hung him on a cross without nails. They tied him to a cross that was in the shape of an X. And they wanted him to slowly die on the cross to leave an example to those who had followed the Apostles. And history tells us that Andrew, hanging on such a cross, for 48 hours preached the gospel to all that listen. And he finished that sermon after 48 hours and he gave up the ghost and went to be with the Lord. The apostles of Christ, they suffered martyrdom apart from the apostle John and Judas Iscariot for a witness unto Christ. Souls are much more important than even the apostles' lives. And the apostle Thomas again, as we studied about very deeply a few years ago, studying from history and the early church writings, the reason why they killed him there in India, because of souls he was leading to the Lord. And they knew if they did not kill him, the Brahmins knew they are going to lose their power, lose their religion, so they had to silence him by killing him because of souls' sakes. And the apostle James, they threw off on the pinnacle of the temple. Why did they do so? Because the soul's getting saved. And that's why they had to kill him. And when he died, he hit the ground and was slowly dying. And those that were tanners who would beat <coughs> fabric, leather fabric with sticks, out of mercy, they beat the apostle James to death so that he would die. The next day, there was a great earthquake. And all those who some realized, we should not have killed that apostle, the apostle James, a witness unto Christ, even in his death. Souls are more important than your comfort. Souls are more important than your safety. Souls are more important than your lives. I heard a story from the pulpit of the Dorfe Church. I do not know if it's a true story or not, but the person who preached the story preached it as if it was the truth. They told a story about how a pastor came up to the pulpit with his adopted son. And they're holding each other and are remembering the day his adopted son died. You see, that pastor's own son brought their adopted son with them on a boating trip. And they've been out swimming out in the waters, he got caught in an undertow. 
and the pastor only had one life preserver to throw to save their lives, the pastor's son and his friend. And the reason why the pastor's son brought his friend up with him on the boating trip was he had been praying for the salvation of his friend's soul. He brought him up there on the boating trip with he and his earthly father so they could be a witness unto him. And as the pastor had made a choice with the life preserver of whose life to save, his own son or his son's friend, his son waved goodbye. He knew because his son was saved. He knew where he was going when he died. He said goodbye to his earthly father because he wanted his friend to get saved. And if his friend died, he would have gone to hell. So the pastor's son waved goodbye to his earthly father, meaning throw the light preserver to my friend. So the pastor threw the light preserver to his son's friend and saved his life. And because of that, that's how that young man got saved. And then that pastor adopted him as his own son and they began serving the Lord together. You see, souls are more important than your own lives, such as the hero of the Titanic, John Harper. And what's so special about John Harper? As he was traveling to preach the gospel, traveling by way of the Titanic, as he was about to sink, John Popper, Harper got his daughter on the safety boats and said goodbye to her. Made sure his daughter was safe now, and he went back. He could have saved his life. They would have allowed him the safety boat with his daughter, who was very young at the time, but he didn't do so. He went back to the Titanic while he was sinking to preach the gospel. And while the Titanic was sinking, everybody to jump into the icy cold waters. There was John Harper swimming away the life preserver, preaching the gospel to all that he met out there floating in the water. And he met a man who didn't have a life preserver, who was on the verge of death. And John Harper asked him, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Are you saved? And the man said, no, he was not. So John Harper took off his life preserver and gave it to that man and continued to swim in the icy cold waters, preaching the gospel. And that man, wearing now John Harper's life preserver to save his life, could hear his voice in the icy cold waves, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in the house. And you can hear him over and over again, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in the house. To his voice disappeared. John Harper went down into an icy grave, preaching the gospel of the end. And that man was John Harper's last convert, because when his life was spared, he, a while later, he testified the church how he got saved that night in the icy cold waters by John Harper's sacrifice of life, sacrifice life preserver to preach the gospel for souls to be saved. That man wearing John Harper's life preserver there in the icy cold waters believed in Lord Jesus Christ and was saved. Souls are more important than your life. Souls are more important than your comfort. Souls are more important than anything else. And the reason why you're on this earth, in this world, which Christ says we shall have tribulation in, is for souls' sakes. For souls to be saved. For us to be witnesses unto Christ to them. And this is why we preach the gospel. Matthew chapter 24. As Christ says in these last days. Matthew chapter 24. Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Why is it we preach the gospel? To score brownie points for the God? No. For a man's recognition? No. Why do we preach the gospel? For a witness unto all nations. Back in the year 2018, I continued to have the same dream over and over again all the way through the year 2019. For two years, I kept having the same dreams. Because for over 20 years, I've been preaching the gospel in these streets of Bangkok, Thailand. 
And in 2018, began having dreams that the streets were empty. The streets were dark. There's not a soul in sight. I didn't know why. The Lord didn't show me why. But I kept having the same dream over and over again that the streets were empty. Nobody was out there in the streets. It was dark. They were on Kaosan Road, which I've been preaching the gospel on since 1998. At that time, 2018, for 20 years, I had dreams that Cow's Run was empty, dark. The lights were turned off, not a soul on the street. And in those dreams, I'd wonder what and the what is this about? Why would this happen? And then, praise God, last year, we saw, or this year, this year, 2020, there was a global pandemic. The world travel stopped. The streets of Bangkok were empty. But the Lord showed us ahead of time. Why? Because the Lord keeps us in his will to preach the gospel for a witness. You see, if we preach the gospel now during this global pandemic, it's not a witness. It would be contrary to being a witness of Christ because of propaganda. And we can't stop the propaganda that people believe in their mainstream news. You can't stop them from believing it. And they're taught here in Thailand, the local people are taught, that this virus is spread by Westerners or non ties Therefore, they've made a rule, if you're out in public, you must wear a mask. And they blame Westerners, the Minister of Health, which the Thais look up to as if he's somebody that knows something. The Minister of Health blamed this virus on Westerners in Thailand not wearing masks. Therefore, if a non Thai in particular, a Westerner is out in public without wearing a face mask, the local Thais say he's the reason why there's this virus in our country right now. He's the reason why our economy is shut down. He's the reason why we have to suffer the what we're doing. And to preach the gospel, you can't do it with a mask on. So now is not the time to preach the gospel on the streets. Though we've been doing it for over 20 years, the Lord showed us there'd be time the streets would be closed to the preach of the gospel because we preach for this reason, for a witness. If our preaching is not a witness unto Christ, it is in vain. The whole reason why we preach the gospel is for souls to be saved. It's all about souls. How many have joined me in preaching the gospel, but their motive was not for souls? Their motives were for other things. Maybe because their home church back in the United States of America supported them, and they needed stories such as the preach of the gospel to get that support. Maybe their mommies and daddies back in the United States of America would be so proud of little sonny boy doing something for the Lord here in Thailand. So they don't preach the gospel for souls. They did it for ulterior motives, such as back 10 years ago in the year 2010, there on Khao Sun Road, we pre preached the gospel. This American who professed to be a missionary was sort of supported by his home church there in the United States of America. And as we're preaching the gospel on Khao Sun Road, after our voices went out, then we began giving out gospel tracts to souls trying to find the souls that the Lord will lead us to for their salvation. And the last gospel track I had in the English tongue that night, there was a man from the United Kingdom, there was a group of people, and praise God, I gave it to that man of all people. He was with the group of people. He later testified on Filipino national television, give his testimony, got born again. He testified when he saw this preacher, he was going to have a go at him. He thought he was going to tear this preacher apart because that man from the United Kingdom, he was an educated man, college educated, was teaching at schools here and also a football coach and thought he was such a smart man, it was going to tear the preacher apart. And then he testified on Philippine national TV years later, he was born again, of what happened that everything that he said, the preacher put him down with the word of God. And he could not believe it that the Word of God had such answers. He thought it was an outdated, archaic book. He's from the United Kingdom, where this version of the Bible comes from, the authorized version. He thought it was outdated. But everything that he tried to say to contradict the Word of God, 
the word of God reproved him every step of the way. So he exchanged information. That man and myself and the self-professed missionary and that man. A few days later, the self-professed missionary completely blocked him on social media because he had ungodly pictures in social media. So he blocked him. We're there for the ungodly to be saved. We're there to be a witness unto Christ. But the self-professed missionary would not do so. And even blocked him on social media. And then he found out a month or two later, that man got born again. He began going to churches with us while preaching the gospel. And then got into the ministry. That self-professed missionary could not believe it. Because souls was not his motive for serving the Lord. He was doing it for other reasons and not for soul's sakes. He was not willing to even endure some ungodly pictures on social media for the soul to be saved. Just like I've testified about many years ago there in Cal Sun Road, I met an older American missionary to China he was here doing his visa for China. He had to come here to Thailand and go to the Chinese embassy to renew his visa and then go back to China again. Not only was he a missionary, he was a university professor. And he had been a Christian much longer than I had been alive at that time. He was a much older man. He witnessed us preaching the gospel on a Friday evening and asked if he could join me on the Lord's Day as he wanted to go to a local Thai church. And I happened to preach at a local Thai church that Lord's Day. So we plans to meet early in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, on Cow Sun Road because as an American, he wanted to eat a big breakfast before church on the Lord's Day. So I met him at his hotel at 8 o'clock in the morning. As we were leaving his hotel together, he needed to exchange some money. So as he went to the money exchange, I walked away from him because I didn't want to be looking over his shoulder while he's exchanging money. So I walked away from him. And while I was sitting there waiting for him, there was this young man who had been drinking all night long, dirty, filthy, sweet of alcohol, staggering down the street, zigzagging down Cow Sun Road, and had two local men following him, waiting to kick him while he was down. And as he was staggering, he saw me, came towards me, and fell right at my feet. And those two men, those local men, were wanting to do him in. So then I told those two local men, never mind, I'll take care of them. I got them as if they were good neighbors or good Samaritans. And they backed off. I told that young man, you've got to get up. Your life is in danger. He was completely passed out. So I had to reach down, pick up this dirty, sweaty man, reeked of alcohol. I was wearing a white dress shirt with a necktie as I was the guest preacher that Lord said that church. Picked that sweaty, dirty man up, which was a lot of dead weight hanging on me. And that American showed up with his money, ready to eat breakfast, and saw me <laughs> holding this drunk, passed out man in my arms, and the expression of that man's face. He was so looking forward to breakfast, and eating a nice breakfast, and going to church. He had his money ready, gonna have a nice breakfast, and there I am carrying this drunk man, telling this American Christian, I've gotta take this drunk man all the way to the other side of Callison Road. There's a guest house, I know the owner, as is associated with a boxing stable I know of, the Sore Willapin, Willapin Camp. And I gotta take this man to that guest house because I made a deal with the owner of the guest house. They could put drunks in there and they wouldn't have to use their ID because a lot of times these drunks don't have identification on them. And they allowed me at that time to put drunks there and I'd pay them a little bit of extra money to do so. So that dragged this man down Cal San Road. And that American man who had been a Christian much longer than I'd been alive just walked beside a silent disappointed he wasn't going to eat breakfast that morning. Looking forward to his breakfast, very disappointed. And finally, halfway down Castle Road, I couldn't go any farther. I hit a physical breath. I was covered in sweat. I was worn out. I was dragging this guy, passed out. And finally, that American chose to help me. Finally, put the other arm around him, and we dragged that guy down that, that guest house. I had to pay extra money. That American man didn't do it with all this money exchange. I had to pay the extra money, put that drunk in that guest house, 
and then went to church at Lord's Day. After the Lord's Day was finished, the church service finished, went straight back to the guest to look for that man, and he was gone. I knew that was going to happen. He woke up, freaked out, didn't know where he was, and just ran out of the guest house. I asked her, what happened? I said, we don't know. He just took off running. So which way did he go? He showed us which direction he went, followed that direction, and found him passed out in a dirty alleyway. Picked him up again, revived him, found that he lived in Canton Ivory, still lived with his parents, was allergic to alcohol, should not have been drinking the night before, got him on the bus, got him back to his home in Canton Ivory, and then finally, in that evening time, we could break fast and eat. And before the food came, I was praising God how it all worked out. I were to find that man in time, get him on the bus, call his parents in Kenton Ivory, get everything worked out. And that American man who had been a Christian much longer than been alive, he started laughing at me. He said, I can't believe your praise of the Lord. He said, Christians that I know, they wouldn't have been praising the Lord for this. They would have been complaining. And then that same man wrote the next day in the email to all these email contacts and put me on his list. And he wrote about me. And he said, I've never met anybody who lives the gospel like Brother Tony. That's a sad thing to say. That man had been a Christian much longer than had been alive. He was a missionary to China, and he's in pastor churches in America before, and yet he knew no one who lived the gospel. They don't care about souls. Even that man I saw in his face, he was more interested in breakfast than he was for souls. He was more interested in his own comfort and his own belly than he was for souls. And he was upset he had to sacrifice breakfast that day and lunch that day, had to eat in the evening time, which is normal for us, because of a soul. He was upset, and when I was praising God that evening, before the food arrived, praise God, everything worked out, how we got to get that man back on the bus, back to his home, be a witness to that man, praising God for that, he began laughing at me as if I was something peculiar, something that he could laugh at, because he said other Christians he knew, including he himself, would not have praised God for that, would have complained. They don't care about souls. When a person is born again, a miracle of miracles happens. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. If you're born again, God's love has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. That's the life-changing power of the new birth. You begin loving others like the Lord loves others. As Christ says in John chapter 15, in the Gospel of John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse, John chapter 16, sorry about that. Ah, John chapter 15, verse 12. Christ says, this is my commandment, the commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ, John 15, verse 12. And Christ is the mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. We are in the New Testament, and this is Christ's commandment. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater loveth no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You cannot do this 
unless you truly have been born again, and the love of God hath been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. It's impossible to love one another as Christ loved us, apart from being born again, apart from the love of God, being shed abroad in the hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And when we are born again, and this miracle happens, we love others as Christ loved us. And how did Christ love us? Greater loveth no man than this, that a man laid down this life for his friends. As the Apostle John writes under the inspiration of the Ghost in the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 3 verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and he that no murder hath eternal life abiding him. Hereby receive ye the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we have to lay down our lives for the brethren. How do we do so? Verse 17. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels and compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word neither tongue, but in deed and in truth. Love is not a feel-good feeling. Love is not a feeling. Love is not a bunch of warm fuzzies. Love is action. It is laying down your life for others. If you see somebody in need, though you may have, and you may think, well, I need to save that for this or for that, and you keep that money to make, no. If you have the love of God, you will sacrifice that for others. You will sacrifice your own life for others if need be. And this is why so many are unfruitful in the preaching of the gospel. Their motive is not for souls. They don't have a love for souls. They don't care about souls being saved. They care more about their own comfort, their own safety, their own things, and not for souls. And they use the preaching of the gospel for other reasons, for man's recognition, to be glorified by man, or think that somehow they're pleasing God by preaching the gospel. But if your heart's not right, you're not doing out of love for souls, to see souls saved, willing to lay down your life for others, your labor is all in vain. And the preach of the gospel is like a tinkling cymbal or a sounding brass. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, Christian love. Not a warm, fuzzy feeling. Not a, I love you, do you love me, I love you. None of that kind of love. Christian love that doesn't love in word and in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Willing to lay down your life for others, loving others as Christ loved us. And greater loveth no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. If you have that charity, though you speak with the tongues of men and angels, you'll become as soundly brass, or a tinkling symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy, how many present Christians boast they can foretell future events, dreams, visions, tongues, interpretations, prophecy, and though I have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries, how many boast they can know the deep things of God, the mysteries of God. God reveals things to them in all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so if you remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. That's why the Bible says in the book of Galatians, in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision fell anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. The faith that pleases God. The faith that the Lord is blessed by. The faith that Christ is looking for and he comes again, as Christ said, shall the Son of Man find faith on the earth when he comes again, is that faith which worketh by love. Because even if you have faith and can remove mountains, 
but have not charity, you are nothing. And so what? You can remove mountains. Christ gave us example of the faith that pleases God. He was willing to cross the sea during a storm and to save his life and the life of his apostles. He had that faith in God to speak to the storm to calm it down because he was going to the other side. And what was he going to the other side for? That one man in a helpless, impossible, hopeless situation to set that man free. He cared for that soul out there in the tombs, crying day and night, cutting himself with stones naked. He cared for that lunatic, possessed with a legion of devils. He cared for him. And that's why his faith pleased God. And that's the kind of faith that we must have, a faith which worketh by love. So what, you can move mountains? Are you doing it for soul's sake? Or are you doing it because of love? Is your faith working because of love? Does your faith work by love? Is the reason why you've got to go by faith and speak to the storms and speak to mountains because you're trying to get to the other side to get some souls saved? Is that what you're doing it for? That's what pleases God. So what, you preach the gospel? Are you a witness to Christ? Are you seeing souls saved? Are you going there for souls to get born again, setting souls free, casting devils out of them? Are you there to minister to souls? Or are you trying to seek man's recognition? Or trying to be glorified by man? Or thinking by preaching the gospel, you're somehow doing God a favor? Is your motive because you love souls? Are you there for souls' sakes? And now, this year, you can see who is a God who is not. Yes, I'm an evangelist, gifted and called by God. And yes, I preach on the streets for 20 years, but there's a time not to preach on the streets like now. Because if we preach on the streets now without wearing a mask, these people have been propagated. 14, no, 70 million people have been propagating this country that non-ties are bringing this virus in the country by not wearing a facial mask. Therefore, if you're a non-tie, knowing that they've been propagated this way, whether you agree with it or not, You've got to wear a face mask. you got to show them you're not the one spreading the virus. And that may hinder you from preaching the gospel, but praise God, we've been faithful all these years anyway. And now we can minister in other ways to souls because it's all about being a witness of Christ. It's all about souls being saved. But if right now, this year, you just not take off that face mask and begin preaching the gospel in these streets, in the open air, you're not being a witness of Christ. You're not going to see souls saved. You're not going to be somebody who's bringing people to the Lord. Instead of being a stepping stone, you become a stumbling block. You turn people from the Lord. This, you're going to find out who has the right motives, who does it. Whose faith worketh by love, and whose does it. Whose preaching the gospel is because of charity for a soul's sake, and whose is not. Yes, I enjoy preaching the gospel. Yes, we look forward to returning back to the streets, but not at this time. Only when we can be a witness unto Christ, guess the whole purpose of the preaching the gospel for souls to be saved. It's all about souls. And our faith to please God must work by love, charity, Christian love, willing to lay down our lives for others. As great love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. It's that kind of faith which works with that kind of love that pleases God that Christ left us an example to follow. Why did he speak to the storm? Because he's trying to get to the other side to get that soul saved. He's trying to get to the other side to deliver that soul. He's getting to the other side because there's a soul at stake. That's why he spoke to the storm. That's why he used faith because it worked by love. A love for souls. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank the Lord for thy word. As thy words, they are spirit and they are life. Sanctify us with truth, for thy word is truth. As thy word is a lamp to feed the light to our path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.